The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. He's, he's doing like the castanets with the clicker tree that we got going on. Welcome, guys, and happy Wednesday. We are the Quirky Happy Dog Holidays. And Merry Christmas. Coming to you, the mayor of Whoville. <laughs> <laughs> What's our quirky tip of the day, love bug? Uh, go back and visit our Christmas episode from last two year. years ago. Two years ago. Two years ago. Much better than this episode. No, really though. We're gonna live link it. It's funny. <laughs> Scott has a full Santa suit on and vitals and an elf no, suit. No, we had Santa as a guest. And I. Scott wasn't able to attend. Oh well, you, you Jeez, sounded a lot like kid, Scott. There's kids that watch the. Damn. I was supposedly Mrs. Claus. There was a lot going on, but today we're gonna talk about Christmas puppies. Mm. That's gonna be a good one, eh? If we must. <laughs> <laughs> puppies are not my favorite thing, but God damn it, let's talk of puppies. Last year's quirky tip. Okay, so two years ago, Scott Santa. That's our quirky tip. I'll live link that episode so you can go back and see it if you want. Last year, our quirky tip was if you're giving your uh, family or your children, most likely, a puppy for Christmas, remember that that dog will be your dog. Like, just let's have our priorities and our reality all straight. <clears throat> So we're going to expound upon the Christmas puppies issue a little bit this year because you got a few days here before Christmas. I assume if you've gotten a puppy for your family for Christmas, you're planning on delivering it this weekend, but we're going to give you a few tips and kind of work through some of the intricacies of what this could look like. You know, I let me take that back about my hatred towards puppies. <laughs> I thought that was a little harsh. Happy you know, holidays. I enjoy other people's puppies. Yes. And they're kind of like, grand, like, like grandchildren. You like our puppies. You can play puppies. with them and give them back. He likes our puppies, too. He loves, I don't know, he's in a mood. It must be the hat. Um, so one thing that I found interesting, you sent me an article about this. There's like a market for Christmas puppies. Of course there is. But this is like a thing that people do. Like they amp up around the holidays and certain breeders and certain ads and everything else. So, I mean, there's a little bit of buyer beware to be conscious of with this whole time of year to begin with. There's some puppy scams out there on the internet, of course, because people are trying to get a puppy for Christmas for whatever reason, for the children, for the girlfriend, the spouse. And uh, just because you want one on Christmas doesn't mean that they're going to be available. I yeah. mean, decent breeders don't make sure that they have uh, <laughs> just a, a bunch of extra puppies around yeah. for the holidays. Yeah. That's not the way it works. <laughs> so what happens is people go on to, um, there's a, you know a few different uh, websites now that they are kind of a network for Holiday breeders puppies, yeah. all over the country. And you can get, if you go onto a website that has, you know, 25 different breeds on it, uh, I would say, you know, be, be cautious because yeah. they're, they're just getting them from God knows where and shipping them to you. And they're like a middleman. So you go back to them and they, they're going to send you to someone else, and then nobody returns emails Yeah, and all that puppy stuff. buying shouldn't be like Amazon. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I know that we do have more things going on virtually now and everything else, but like Scott said, I mean, breeders that breed a few breeds, that's one thing. But when there's like six plus breeds and a bunch of purebred breeds and a bunch of doodles and stuff, watch out for that. And the other thing I want to say, yeah, because called, I know... It's called like the Breeders Network, those yeah, type of names. Then. Yeah, and I know that this is all in motion, right? Like we're not trying to detract anyone or bomb anybody out that may be on this journey of getting a puppy for their family and everything else. However, I do want to say, if there's a red flag right now, like if the dog is not in your possession yet and you have this little eight to 10 week old puppy that you're expecting to have in your home this weekend... And there's just something that doesn't feel right, whether it's a gut check or the breeder is doing something weird or you met the puppy and the puppy seems like lethargic, little low energy. Realize that you haven't actually gifted this puppy yet. And if it's something that you can forfeit the deposit or you don't have to, you know, get involved with this relationship, it's a long commitment, right? Like we often say this, it's 12 to 15 years of a commitment, depending on what breed you get. So make sure that if you have this like uh, instinctual, I'm not sure, I don't know what to do. You have a few days here. It would be okay to forfeit if it's something that's really screaming at you. Well, let's assume they're getting the puppy. All right. Okay, we're working so let's forward help now. Out. You've right. accepted this three-legged puppy that came in the mail. <laughs> 
<laughs> and you're going to make and, the most of it. And the kids were happy to open it. Okay, so this is one thing. So we gift it Christmas morning. Of course, all of the reason to give a puppy or any animal this time of year is for the reaction, right? So we have all these videos then online. Scott was showing me video upon video upon video of, oh, look at this person on Christmas. No, oh, look people, at this. People just melting and crying. Yes, but this falling is... Falling to the floor. If you've had a problem with your girlfriend, get her a puppy. <laughs> You're but this all set. is, or, but this or is why matter. everybody does it for this moment, right? So this moment is important. The day is important. Everything else. What happens after the video and after Christmas and everything else? And one thing I want to note, and this is something to really consider because now the kids are going back to school. We're not doing virtual school. Like, yes, they're all home on break. Realize that after this Christmas weekend coming up and the puppy being there, then we want to kind of start that family schedule like right from the get-go, right? Like Monday morning, like we can say to the kids, you don't have to wake up the time you would for school, but maybe wake up when that first bell starts. Like let's get the puppy on a schedule because if the puppy is living in this very like loose and it goes out whenever and the kids see it at 10 a.m. and the parents are already taking the reins right from the get-go, it's going to be a harder transition when the kids go back to school. So my first piece of advice would be, Let's get that freaking puppy into the routine that the family lives day in, day out. I would back up even a little bit uh, further and say that after everyone's done crying and <laughs> fawning over this puppy, <laughs> that you have a pen set up for yeah. it so that you can put the puppy in a pen so that the kids or the other, whoever's there, can open other gifts because now you're not going to be watching that puppy, you know, every second. And you don't want the puppy eating tinsel and little hooks that hang like uh, Christmas bulbs on the tree and all kinds of crap that they can get into that will be on the floor. So have a pen set up or a crate, whatever it is, but some type of management system in place so that uh, that should be the next gift that's opened. Oh, a pen. <laughs> Wow. Oh, I got a puppy. Oh, I got a crate. And that's true. I was going to mention the crate thing for sure. But Christmas morning, it, it brings up an even better point that like the dog's not necessarily going to want to get a bunch of love and go in a crate. If you have a pen, you can throw some chews in there, throw some toys in there. It's more like an actual play pen, right? It's not just for sleeping. So the pen is a great idea in addition to the crate. The rest of the gifts are for the puppy. <laughs> <laughs> here's a chew. Here's this. Here's that. Even with that said, like, okay, what are you going to have for the puppy? What are you going to have for it to chew on when it first gets home? Everything else. If you're going grocery shopping between now and Christmas, pick up some marrow bones from the butcher. I wouldn't let the puppy finish a marrow bone. It could upset their GI system, but that is a great, exciting, like primal gift for them to have. Right. <clears throat> and I'm very wary about what we recommend now for chews. We had farmhounds on the podcast. We love farmhounds for our dogs. They're great chews. We're obsessed with the hides. You can't order those by Christmas right now. It's a website they online. They seem to be back ordered quite yeah, a bit and, too. And you, you're just not going to get that by Christmas. So if you need something to entertain this puppy, right? Like d during the rest of Christmas day, when the toys are being assembled, consider marrow bones. It's a great one. You ask your butcher, they have little small ones. Yeah. Let's talk about pottying. Well, the puppy is going to have to, you want to get into your controlling your water and whatnot, but mm -hmm. puppies need to go out a lot. It's just like having a, a newborn in the house that, you know, they're in a diaper, so you don't worry about taking them out. They just pee their diaper for two years. But <laughs> <laughs> with, a, with a puppy, ideally, you want them to be housebroken. So you want to get on that housebreaking journey right away. Yeah. And if it's winter, right? Like this pops up a lot. If it's winter and you live in a climate where maybe you have snow or at least it's really cold, consider that when it comes down to pottying, right? Like you want that dog to be going out, going to the bathroom quickly and coming back in. So rather than maybe going out and spending 45 minutes with a puppy, five minutes, doesn't potty, back in for 10. Five minutes, doesn't potty, back in for 10. For me, especially during these cold months, I want that dog to know that we will not be out here for more than a couple of minutes. So whatever has to happen, happen quick. You don't want them to think that you're taking a big luxurious hike around the highway and over the river and through the woods just to go potty. Like, no, go to the bathroom. Bathroom, it's freezing out. And with that said, do you have anything else to say about well, potting? If you're in New England, <laughs> then you're going to want to have an area where you can take that. It's now think about yourself going out in inclement weather on a regular basis. Yeah. So if you have an overhang on the back of the house, something where you can go to a certain area where you may be shoveling snow out of that area for this puppy so the puppy can actually get its feet on the ground and not just sink into <laughs> eight inches of snow or a foot of snow. You need to have an area that's, you know, pre-designated. This is the potty area, and I'm going to bring this puppy out there through these t really rough months. If you're in the Midwest or Kentucky, you want to have a tornado shelter <laughs> that you bring your puppy to. Yeah, I guess tornadoes can come at any time of the year now. It's kind of been a tough go yeah, for the Midwest. Brutal. Yeah. Um, and with that said, and Scott's mentioning snow, and this is important, like... 
the, if the puppy just goes out and licks snow and doesn't go to the bathroom, now it's in taking liquids. Taking We've talked in. about this before. You're going to have an issue with the potty training. A puppy is small, right? Like they have little legs. They have a lot of growing to do. <clears throat> if you put them in any amount of snow and they just sink, they're not going to want to be going to the bathroom. So shoveling is important. Even if it's that fresh, easy, powdery snow that's super fun to make snowballs out of and everything else, like you need to clear an area for them if they have snow. And with the cold weather and the inclement weather, the other thing you want to consider is sweaters. And this, like, I didn't think about this much, right, until we owned a three-pound Pomeranian that was Scott's daughter's dog, and, like, we live in New England, and we've seen other dogs that don't have a lot of coat and stuff. This is a thing, you guys. Like, I feel like I say that about everything. This is a thing. This is a thing. But this really is a thing with dogs. They're cold, right? They need to have a sweater on. Now, if you have a Bernese Mountain Dog puppy or a puppy that's hardier with a big coat, that's fine. Get them in and out. But if it's a breed that does not have a lot of hair or it's not going to ever be more than 20 pounds or something when it grows into its full size, yeah. consider a sweater. If you've had your heart on an Italian greyhound and yeah. you live in <laughs> northern Maine, yeah. you better stock up on sweaters. It's true. And like they get wet and you need and additional whippets. sweaters when they get older. Yeah, I mean, depending on the breed, the sweater thing is not like, oh, wow, that dog's wearing clothes. Like, no, that dog needs to wear clothes because it's freaking freezing out. So Boxers be conscious of that. One. You know, these, these dogs that are not only have a short coat, but they have very low body fat. They're lean dogs and they're going to get cold quick and it's going to get them, you know, right down to their core. You know? Yeah. So if you don't have anything like that and you do have a dog that does not have a lot of coat or it's not going to, you know, grow up to be a dog that's 30 plus pounds, more of a hardier breed, or like Scott even said, a greyhound or a whippet or whatever, they're still going to be a bigger dog, but they're not going to have a lot of coat get something for them so when you're going outside to get them to go to the bathroom, they can withstand being out there for more than 30 seconds to a minute. Yeah. And I will say that, you know, dogs can learn to build up a tolerance to cold weather. But the way we pamper dogs, that's never going to happen. You know, I mean, I've visited hunting dogs in New Hampshire and Maine that live outdoors year round, and they just put hay in their box. You know, they have like an outdoor type of a yeah, but Great. even then, sometimes the puppies are even raised out with hay. Like, they're they're That's already I mean. getting, I mean, yeah, they're being they're, brought up as hardy puppies. Yeah, those dogs are outside in 10-degree weather, and they're just kind of used to it, but that's not... That's not the norm. Yeah. You know, most Bye. people are not doing anything like that. Those <laughs> Don't are, sleep the dog in the shed. Buy him a sweater. They're not pets, I guess, <laughs> is the bottom line. They're more hunting dogs, you Yeah. Know? All right, let's go to break. When we get back, we're going to talk more about Christmas fun. Does your dog lack self-control? Are you looking for some answers? Would you like your dog to be calmer? Does your dog lack confidence? Canine MindShift. Enroll in a free course today. Simply go to caninemindshift.com. That's caninemindshift.com. All right, we're back. Can you believe it's Christmas week? Well, maybe what we should talk about is just everything you're going to need for a puppy. You know, you need a, a good puppy food. You need you should have a crate or a pen. There's just some basics. That, you know, maybe I would buy a half a dozen leashes. I'd have several leashes around the property, around the house, so you always have access to a leash when you need it. I'd get a collar and a, and a leash on the puppy pretty soon, early on, let him drag that around a bit. The puppy, the puppy package, we could call it. Yeah, you need a puppy kit. Yeah. To go along with the and, puppy. And don't get too wrapped up into a million different toys and all this stuff right now, right? Like a the few toys indestructible are toys are great. That's to drain the wallet or the toys. Yes, exactly. Like these big box stores, they it's the pet industry is a multi-billion dollar industry because of us, right? So rather than buying the puppy like six things that look super cute, buy it a pretty durable toy. I guarantee you the puppy will play with a freaking box. Like puppies play with crap, right? Like they don't need all these toys. It's just like children. You spend all this money on the kids for Christmas and, oh my gosh, this is the best toy and it was $500 and everything else. And the kid's literally like throwing the wrapping paper around all mm -hmm. Christmas gleeful. And, and the puppy just wants to chew on your slipper. Yeah. That's it. You yeah. Know, so. so don't don't get too wrapped up into spending a lot of money on those things. Deal with the necessities. And when Scott's saying multiple leashes, it's hilarious. Half the time we go to somebody's home, they can't find a leash to save their life. So Keep leashes in various rooms. Start controlling the puppy. Start confining its environment and shaping it to be the dog that you want to live with. And go ahead. What were you going to say? I was going to say that, uh, you know, it seems like everybody has this open floor plan house these days. But um, if you have a normal home that has rooms in it, get the little, <laughs> with you know, doors. the kids gates to put in to yes. block so that you can 
you know, keep the puppy in the kitchen or in a room that has linoleum or tile or so that um, you can just, again, control the the dogs, uh, where they're going. And so they're supervise not just the from dog. One yeah. room to another all the time. And supervise the dog better. Like the puppy can totally chill, chill with you the whole time you make dinner or breakfast or whatever, but you need to be able to see the puppy and you can't be attending to a frying pan and chasing the puppy around the house, seeing what's happening. And even the people with open floor plans, like Amazon alone, there's a lot of options now for well, like cool a, things to separate your life out. Yes. Yeah. You got to have a pen if you're going to have an open floor plan and then you can put a tent or, you know, as big or depending on the size of your home, but have a ring that's fenced in where the puppy's got their space and all that stuff. You yeah. Know? One thing I want to talk about, and I guess this could be a situation that, like Scott was saying, if you get a puppy for your girlfriend rather than with the kids. But if you are getting a puppy for the family with kids, and we've hit this home various ways, you know, throughout the Quirky Dog, interviewing people with kids and families and talking about different management things. But one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give to you guys is if kids are involved, implement those responsibilities ASAP, right? So I was saying, like, you know, don't let the kids just sleep the whole break. Like, let's get them up early. I don't even care if the kid does one thing. Like, it does not matter if the kid maybe just goes and picks up the poop in the morning and puts it in a bag or feeds the dog one meal, just one thing, but make sure they're a part of that and they're learning this responsibility because caring for an animal is something that is like of utmost importance to me that we teach our society to do. And it seems to be something that we're understanding less and less over time. Like, honestly, people don't understand how to care for animals. It's harder for techs to understand how to handle these dogs. It's harder for people to understand how to keep their dogs safe. It's harder for kids to understand that dogs actually need something and that they actually need food and water and pottying and exercise to exist because their parents are just doing it and enabling. So consider that, implementing some responsibility for each family member and a consistent chore, not just something that you do, you know, once a month, something consistent. Yeah, I mean, something you could do with younger kids is uh, do a little brushing session with a puppy that is just a pseudo brushing session. You're not yeah. really brushing the puppy, but you're going through the motions. And by just having the puppy stay in one place and going through this little exercise for three minutes, it's just building the foundation of what's to come, and that's the grooming and checking the ears and yeah. the basic handling of that puppy. And just teaching some tolerance, because if this is always coming from the adults, right, kind of this top-down approach, then the dogs may not respect the kids as much. Does it mean that the kids need to be cutting the dog's toenails? No, but we want the dog to understand that all of these family members rank higher than I do. Like, that's something that's important, and it's not even a hierarchical thing. It's just say, how a family... Some kind of, some kind of dominance <laughs> theory this, you're going I'm on here? Monks of New Skate, Chris. But really, like, this is part of how we want the dog to understand how to integrate. Another thing that you'll see a lot of times is kids get afraid, right? Like, they want to pet the puppy, and then they're, like, retreating and backing off. Or they want to give the puppy a cookie, but either the lips or the tongue or the teeth, whatever, it gets them to retreat. If your kid, your son, your daughter what have you, is having an issue with that type of situation when it comes to petting and when it comes to giving treats. For treats, I would full-on go to, like, giving the horse a treat, right? Like open the palm of the hand, have the kid put the hand out there. You can even help stabilize the hand calmly, but make sure that hand is available to the dog to take the cookie off of the open palm. Because what happens is the dogs start to get grabbier and grabbier because they know their time is short because the kids are playing this game. If it's an affection thing and the kids are afraid to pet the dog or something else, sometimes what I've found is if you turn the dog laterally, right? So here, I'll use my pig. You turn the animal laterally to you. Perpendicular, if you will. <laughs> and you're controlling the dog, the kid can pet the side of the dog now, right? Like coming to the face and backing off is totally different. So you can control the situation. The kid can pet from the side, but we want to get them comfortable with that because the more that it becomes a game and like this keep away and this kind of like dance of sorts, the worse of a problem you could have as the dog grows up. Yeah, I mean, and an adult can handle just about any puppy. And that, another good reason to have the collar on the puppy, because you can slip a thumb through that collar to stabilize the puppy. They do have very sharp little needle teeth, so they will hurt an adult or a child pretty easily. Not They're gonna, not going to severely injure anybody, but they're going to hurt when they bite with those yeah. little needle teeth. And if it's an older person, they're gonna, it's going to cut the skin. The skin is getting real thin and yeah. crepey. So you want to stabilize them so that the child can interact in a safe way so that they don't all of a sudden get paranoid and all this stuff, you know, over the Yeah, puppy. you want the, the initial reps and the initial interactions 
just to go pretty smoothly and go without a lot of chaos, right? You know, and sometimes like the kids get really excited and everything else, but we can teach them right from the get go. Like we need to be calm. We need to do this. Like this, these are things that if you implement from the very beginning, it's just kind of a way of life with the dog rather than figuring it out as you go along. And I guess it means a lot more to me because I grew up with dogs, right? Like this is who I am as a person. I've had dogs since I was three years old. We had puppies that, you know, were being raised when I was growing up. I was competitive in dog sports when I was a very young child. I went to the world finals by the time I was 15. I worked with my dogs a lot. I understand that every kid isn't going to do that, but I also understand that dogs are flighty and maybe kids do want to work with the dog and everything else. So one thing I would recommend is if the kid wants to interact with the dog, put the dog on a leash or at least have the kid and the dog be in the bathroom. You can be in there supervising too. But if you just give the kid a freaking crumb of a cookie, the whole house, the dog can run anywhere it wants. The kid's going to be bummed out if the dog's constantly piecing out. If they have a smaller area for training or they can at least control the dog by having the dog on a leash with the cookie, then that scattered brain thing can kind of get at least channeled into the work with the child and there may be a better foundation to build on. So if your kid is interested in being a part of things, please let them. This was part of my issue. I wanted to do dog sports when I was little. They said I was too young to do agility. They said I was too young for this. It was back in the day. Nobody wanted to deal with kids. Now, then I did disc and it all evolved. But if the kids want to be involved, please let them, but set it up so they can feel successful. And so the dog can also have some satisfaction. Like don't let the kid just go and deal with the dog for 40 minutes and you have no idea what happened. Yeah. And if the child is under say seven years old, there's a good possibility that the child will become the puppy's toy. Yeah. And that's what you want to be careful of because now the child is, you know, retreating, moving around and the puppy is chasing the puppy biting and nipping for fun, not because it's aggressive, but they no. see this kid darting around and they're chasing it and grabbing its feet and grabbing its hands. And then it becomes a problem. And you the know? kids are squealing and making noises because that's what kids do. But it's similar to like puppies that are like chasing after prey, right? Like all of that. So be conscientious. Scott's totally right. And just supervise these interactions. Don't just let everything evolve. And that doesn't mean every time the kid and the dog interacts, like you're going to be like, oh my gosh, what's happening every moment? But at least these first few weeks and these first few months, make sure you're clear on what's actually going on. Red light, green light. <laughs> That's what you want to play. Kids are getting crazy. Red light. <laughs> red In light my is house, harder. it was always red light. Red light is harder to implement <laughs> these days with child rearing, it seems. All right. What is your favorite part about Christmas? What is your favorite Christmas tradition or your favorite Christmas... Well, I like eggnog and cookies. Oh, he, d he does you know? like cookies. I like the pastries. <laughs> I like all the good he, food. He does and, um, like the cookies. That's something He's I enjoy. Getting a little bigger on the middle again. He's talking um, about fasting. It is great with young children, you know, when they, you know, the, this, that excitement of a young child opening yeah. presents and all that is, is nice. But now that I'm an old fogey, I'm becoming more and more like Scrooge. <laughs> no, no, he just likes <laughs> his Actually, cigars. Actually, we just went to see the Christmas Carol. A musical down in Beverly and Theater in the Round. That was nice. And that was really a nice thing. And it, it's not a tradition. See, he's not that cool. But we've been to that. How many times have we seen that? Maybe three, three Probably or four times. three or four, yeah. And uh, that's something I, I like watching the Christmas Carol on TV in black and white. It's something that I did when I was a kid. And it's something that's always on now. You can watch it anytime you want with Netflix and Amazon and all that. But that kind of... That gets me in that kind of spirit of the holidays is watching that old 19... 39 version likes, of the Christmas he likes Carol. The old school one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right. Well, the Christmas Carol not, gets not him the in the spirit. The, That's good. I mean, as much as I like Henry Winkler, I could never get around the Fonz being <laughs> Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite part of Christmas is watching the dogs open presents on Christmas. And last year, I got to give it to Scott. I was laid up. I dislocated my knee a few weeks before Christmas. So I was laid up. And Scott bought all the dogs gifts last year, and he did a bang-up job. But we did it together this year. So I think I'm the dogs probably it was one of the better Christmases <laughs> for the dogs now that you mention it. <laughs> you guys, we hope that you and your families and your dogs have a very merry holiday. If you're introducing a puppy into your family this weekend, congratulations. It's going to be awesome. But consider you know, cycling through some of these tips. We're trying to help you out there. And we got just a few days left of 2021. So make it the say, best that it possibly can be. If you want your dog to unwrap gifts, put a little treat inside the package for them and they'll start, that'll <laughs> help them work their way through that paper. A quirky closing tip. Keep it quirky, guys. Merry Christmas. We'll see you next week. <laughs> 
The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.